Today we're going to start our third uh, segment here, which is the Reconstruction Era and after, the period following the Civil War. Now, I have talked uh, on occasion earlier in the term about what we call the politics of history, right? The politics of history. How politics influences the study of history and how history influences politics. And uh, as I've said many a time, this is going on today. Here's an article from the Financial Times with a rather alarming headline, How Wars Can Be Started by History Books. History textbooks can start wars. That's extreme. He's talking about particularly, well, controversies all over the world about the teaching of history, particularly the controversy between China Japan and South Korea. In Japan, the new prime minister or recent prime minister is trying to stop history textbooks from adopting a masochistic view, as he calls it, of the country's history. That is reducing attention to some of the atrocities the Japanese committed in China and Korea during World War II. Um, the Chinese are complaining bitterly about this, as are, and as are South Koreans. And this is the U.S. There's an article about the same thing in the New York Times. U.S. emerges as central stage in Asian rivalry. These, particularly South Korea and Japan, are fighting their battle over history here in the U.S. There's not one tenured professor on the East Coast who's not been contacted by one or another of these countries to get on their side. They have lobbyists lobbying state legislatures. For example, in Virginia, they just passed a law requiring textbooks to use the Korean name for the Sea of Japan, not the Japanese name. That's the, the, the Korean name is the East Sea, the Japanese, all right, so it's now a law in Virginia. We've got to side with the Koreans in their battle with the, China, with the Japanese over the history of that region. Um, lobbyists are making a lot of money out of this, apparently, um, of both. And then other countries are doing the same thing, uh, etc. Even Britain, he says, it's kind of weird, even Britain, as if Britain never stoops to do anything other than the most, you know, the most gentlemanly. No, even Britain is full of controversy about how history should be taught. The education secretary is suggesting that children are being given a negative view of the First World War. What other view can you have of the First World War? <laughs> we should be celebrating the First World War as a great achievement for mankind. Um, so anyway, the, the conclusion, there is nothing unusual in the efforts of political leaders to try to influence the way their nation's history is taught. By the same token, there's nothing unusual in history affecting the politics of a country or how we think about it. And that is really my theme to some extent, and talk, what I want to talk about today is how we have thought about the history of Reconstruction and why it's important before getting into the actual history. Now, Reconstruction has a peculiar place in American historical consciousness. It's overshadowed by the Civil War, obviously, in terms of people's memory. Sometimes it's all but forgotten. Back in the early 1990s, the uh, Department of Education did a survey of graduating seniors, about 15,000 of them from American high schools, and they were supposed to, um, to see what they, it, it was kind of a thing to identify things in American history. Now, 95% could say, or say something intelligible about them. 95% could say something about the westward movement. 80% could say something about the dropping of the first atomic bomb. But the lowest score of all, only 20%, was Reconstruction. Only 20% of graduating seniors from American high schools could say anything about Reconstruction. Since I had recently published a 700-page book on Reconstruction, I found this disheartening. <laughs> but the fact is that even though we may not know much about it, Reconstruction keeps, is part of our life today. That's, that's the point I want to make. It's remarkably relevant. And even if we're unaware of it, it, is, it still has its impact on the present. The issues that agitate, issues that agitate American politics today. Who is an American citizen? What are the rights that come with being an American citizen? What are the relative powers of the national government and the states? Affirmative action, 
the relation between political democracy and economic democracy, the proper response to terrorism. Every single one of those is a Reconstruction question, which was debated in Reconstruction. And during Reconstruction, laws and constitutional amendments were enacted that still are on the books today shaping how Americans respond to all of these questions. Reconstruction is embedded in our judicial processes. Every session of the Supreme Court adjudicates issues arising from the 14th Amendment, which we will talk about next week, and the civil rights legislation of Reconstruction. Um, uh, assumptions about Reconstruction still affect the Supreme Court and what I actually think is a misinterpretation of Reconstruction that is embedded in the jurisprudence that is still alive today in the Supreme Court. I will talk about that. Um, at the same time, the definition of liberty in the 14th Amendment, which as we'll see, deprives states or denies states the power to deprive American citizens of liberty, among other things, the definition of that liberty continues to expand. It's the 14th Amendment that provided the basis, for example, in the last two, 10 years for court, Supreme Court decisions overturning laws stigmatizing gay Americans. This was not on the minds of the people in 1866 when they passed the 14th Amendment, but the concept of liberty has expanded and the 14th Amendment gives the federal government the power to enforce it even if the liberty they're talking about is very different than what was being talked about back then. Or on another issue, it is the 14th Amendment that has, le that has empowered the Supreme Court to overturn laws restricting the ownership of guns. That's another liberty, the right to bear arms, which they've said applies not only to federal government but to the states in, in some recent decisions. Um, here's my point. Now, this is another thing that just popped up this week. Kansas School District apologizes for only inviting African-American students on a field trip. This uh, high school in Kansas, oh, invited the black students in their school to go on a trip to uh, an American jazz museum and a civil rights museum. Now, what is the point? They said, well, that's only of interest to blacks, but my point is that is absurd. This is part of American history. Reconstruction, the former slaves were key actors in Reconstruction, as we will see, but this is a history that affects every single American. I don't care if you're white, black, Asian, gay, straight, whatever, this history is part of our lives today, and that's why people should know about it, even if they often don't. And um, when we face crises, people begin to wonder about what they originally learned about Reconstruction. Taylor Branch, in his book on Martin Luther King, tells a story about President Kennedy back in 1962. 1962, there were these riots at the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss, when uh, James Meredith, the first black student, was brought to the campus, and that night the two people were killed and rioting on the campus. Um, and uh, Kennedy, following this, remarked, he said that, I'm getting the impression that my Harvard professors misled me about the fanatical Northerners who tried to impose Reconstruction on the South after the Civil War. It makes me wonder whether everything I heard about the evils of Reconstruction is really true. Maybe Thaddeus Stevens had a good point, says Kennedy. A hundred years later, he had been taught that Stevens was a sort of evil villain, but now seeing what's going on in the South, maybe that history is relevant to us. Or on a somewhat less exalted note, if you've ever read Bob Dylan's book Chronicles, he says in there, I read the biography of Thaddeus Stevens. Let's look at Stevens, because he, the great commoner, as he was called, because he's going to pop up a number of times. I read the biography of Thaddeus Stevens, the radical Republican. He was quite a character. He's from Gettysburg. He grew up poor, made a fortune. From then on, championed the weak and any other group who wasn't able to fight equally. He had a grim sense of humor. He wanted to confiscate the land of the slaveholding elite. He got right in there, called his enemies a feeble band of lowly reptiles. Stevens was hard to forget. He made a big impression on me, says Bob Dylan. I don't know if Dylan's ever written a song about Thaddeus Stevens, but um, maybe. So now the language of Reconstruction, at least some little bits of it, are still alive today. 
For example, the word carpetbagger is part of our lexicon. It's hard to escape. Whenever there's political campaigns, the, the word carpetbagger pops up. But that really is a reconstruction uh, term. We'll talk about what it meant or what it means. We in New York State are very, even though it's a negative, a term of abuse, in New York State we kind of like carpetbaggers. Two of our most famous members of the U.S. Senate were carpetbaggers. Robert F. Kennedy moved here from Massachusetts and Hillary Clinton moved here from Arkansas to get elected to the, to the Senate, so, or from Washington. So, but we, they're called carpetbaggers, a reconstruction term. In fact, in his book, Cultural Literacy, which was a bestseller some years ago, the um, educational charlatan, I mean the theorist, <laughs> E.D. Hirsch, well, anyone who just lists a thousand things and says that is what you need to know as an educated person. Of course, a lot cheaper than going to college. But um, <laughs> carpetbagger is one of the thousand terms you need to know to be an educated person, according to E.D. Hirsch. But oddly enough, Reconstruction is not on the list. So you can be an educated American and never have heard about Reconstruction, but if you don't know the word carpetbagger, you're just a sap, according to E.D. Hirsch. And of course, another phrase from Reconstruction, which is still part of our language, is 40 acres and a mule, the name of Spike Lee's film company, and also a, uh, just part of dialogue in some places. A few years ago, Harper's Magazine ran a, which does kind of, avant-garde sort of things, ran a discussion among members of an L.A. street gang with colorful names like Bing, T, and Ratneck. T, T said uh, that he said, I had a friend who left school because he found prejudice alive in America and I don't have to stand it, he said. As a matter of fact, you owe my great-grandfather 40 acres and a mule. Now, where this guy T got this idea of 40 acres and mule, I have no idea, but it's just part of the sort of discourse. 